Good evening and welcome to Season 3 of The Real Politique. I'm your host, Dr. Shane Mohammed, and it is my pleasure to have our first episode, the unique and very rare sit-down with Professor Rosemary Bell Antoine, the first female principal of the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine. Good evening, principal. Good evening, Dr. Mohammed. Lovely it, to be with you. It is such an exciting pleasure to sit with you. I think this is one of the pinnacles of my media career. Well, let's wait until after the interview <laughs> <laughs> before you say that. <laughs> you know, um, you've broken the glass ceiling in academia. This is you, Professor Rosemary Bellantoine, shattering the glass ceiling for St. Augustine because it's been done in Barbados. Mm. Um, I don't think it's been done in, in Jamaica as yet. Sort of halfway. Sort of halfway. Somebody but for you, one year. Yeah, but you've you've crashed the glass, and you know that means a lot in academia. Mm. What does it mean for you? To be perfectly honest, I never thought of it in those terms, but I do recognize that for a lot of people it is meaningful, so I don't want to trivialize it. I've never really thought of myself in terms of gender. That sounds odd because I have, of course fought for rights, including gender equality. But I grew up in a family where, perhaps you could say woman is boss. <laughs> My father was a very liberated man for his time, I realize now with hindsight. And we had this little joke, he would come and say, any male? And he said, no, only females. <laughs> I did have three brothers, but all my, my family, the women in my family were always treated as equal and very strong individuals. So I never, as I said, I never defined myself and certainly in terms of the principal, I didn't approach it well. I want to be the first female principal. It's afterwards, it sort of hit me that people kept talking about this. But having said that, I do realize that, yes, I believe in um, individualism and merit, but it is true that we have a lot and a longer way to go in terms of genuine gender equality. That is for sure. We live in an environment where we are fast learning about a new acronym that has found its way into the academic world, DEIB, Diversity, Equality, Inclusion, and Belonging. By the way, I'm very bad with acronyms. <laughs> Me too. Don't worry. I learned it only because I was doing some review of papers yes. and found that a lot of the academic papers spoke about DEIB mm. and how do you, sp now stepping out as the first female, and you will carry that for the rest of your life, yes. um, how do you intend to bring, and given that you fight and you, you, you are an advocate for gender equality, how, you, how do you intend to bring it into your portfolio as head of the campus? Well, for me, of course, diversity is much more than gender. Um, all my life I've taught, taught and talked and advocated for equality in all kinds of platforms and, and diversity, of course. You have other issues, you have race, you have class, you know, and I think the whole gamut. So that for me, um, I don't have an agenda to make females more X or Y or males as the case may be. Actually, it, 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 it might surprise you to know that I am probably just as or more concerned about the, the few men that are entering tertiary education in particular, and not just tertiary education. I, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that um, there's a, a crisis in terms of many males in relation to achieving or wanting to achieve. Nothing to do with intelligence or capacity or skills, it, the sociologists have to tell us what's happening, but something is happening. And that, of course, is more complex because it's also stratified in some cases by race. Mm -hmm. so, so, so these are huge issues that I think not just me, but the university has to help the society to address. Because for me, a society, especially one like ours, which is pluralistic, which is, it is in essence diverse, to me, the, the outputs and the achievements and the productivity has to reflect that diversity. You know, um, 
it's a very difficult thing to do, especially in a post-colonial society where there are natural tensions or maybe unnatural tensions which have been perpetuated. Sort of, yes, perpetuated. But I think that I certainly see myself as having a role in that. I, I think I have a certain objectivity and neutrality and I define myself as a Kalalu person in terms mm -hmm. of ethnicity. So I'm probably a good person to, to sort of probably don't belong neither here nor there kind of thing. But um, we, university and academics and policymakers, I think we have to address that head on in the society. For a long time, we pretended it didn't exist. And then we, we acknowledge it existed, but in the worst possible ways, try to address it, like see what happens around, around um, elections, elections and so on, which is the worst time. In fact, I had a big race symposium just after the last election to try to deconstruct some of those things. So that's probably not the best time to talk about these issues when we're all hot and sweaty, the silly season, as they call it. But we are beginning to see it has deep implications, I think, for the society. So certainly, I see my role as trying to bring more equality and more equity, first of all, on the campus, but in the society. And I think we, not me, we as UE intellectuals and so on, have to be out there being responsible citizens and, and leaders in the community, trying to do some healing. So I'm glad you raised the idea of not you, but we, and UE academics. Mm -hmm. academia, right? There's the perspective, there's the perception out there among students mm -hmm. about, and I mean, there's also, there's the perception of young academics struggling on, and I could talk about SDA, um, struggling to, to move up, mm -hmm. struggling to find a space, struggling to achieve goals which involves them becoming, wanting to become academics and wanting to be part of that part of that you mean side. Academ young academics struggling or people out there who want to be academics? People who are here, mm. they are young. So students have struggled to, with regard to finding academics mm. in terms of the persons in academia to relate to. Mm. There's that gap between relatability, between and and mentorship. And then there are those who are wanting to get into academia and have either been discouraged, thrown aside, displaced, removed, and they get they 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 they, they, they it, it kills their motivation. Mm -hmm. You bring a different perspective. You said we. How do you intend to gauge that all? But if you mean to get jobs in UE, is that what you mean? To get jobs in UE, one, but also to connect the academics in terms of the, the, the persons who, the, the, the lecturers, I should say, the professors, to maintain a connect of relatability with students. Mm -hmm. So there's a greater sense of belonging. Well, I think um, it varies a lot. You have some lecturers and so on who are really, really um, integrated into student life, who go the extra mile and who are mentors and do it very well. Then there are others, of course, who are just concerned about you know, either their publication record or teaching their classes. And I mean, that's probably always been the case. We are doing, trying to do a lot more in terms of the student satisfaction, we are aware of those things. And I, in fact, I have a very vibrant young man in student services who came to me with a whole set of ideas and we have to roll these out. So we have some work to do there for sure. Um, I always believe that lecturers are inevitably mentors and examples as well as look up to you without you, you realizing it sometimes. So I think Part of that is infusing into our academic staff and our non-academic staff because when I was Dean of Law, I started off with, with some admin staff who, who didn't feel connected to their students and after we had a few sessions and so on, I mean, when I left law, they were the best admin staff you could find. They were so invested in the students because I said, you know, we, we worked it through. 
in fact, I remember in COVID, they were calling my students to be sure me without me having to ask. That's how far they grew. So it's really getting people to understand that this is not just a sort of a cold-hearted business where you go, but there is a, a, a there's, is need for that kind of mentorship and, and connection and really caring Correct. about people that you're with. So we have that work to do. In terms of people wanting to get into academia, it is, of course, very competitive. But the best I can say to you, for those who probably feel they should have gotten, is that the process has become a lot more transparent. Certainly under my watch, I have um, said certain things and done certain things to I cannot um, sort of scrutinize every single appointment but I think I've said enough I'm doing enough to, to let everybody know even things like acting that you know I want all posts advertised I want to ensure that the people on the panels are I'm not saying they weren't before but I'm just saying there is that there can sometimes be that perception so I think one of the ways you deal with it and we have a new HR director who's aware of these things too that you ensure that people interview others are themselves objective as much as can be, that they represent a wide array of, uh, and so on. What is, so you talked about professorship and I want to come back to that eventually, but I want to talk about what is one of, what is your Rosemary Bell Antoine's forget professor right now, right? You as an individual, what is Rosemary Bell Antoine's management philosophy that she's <laughs> that is personal to her, that she's going to take now as principal of UE onto the campus. I wonder what it is. I, I don't know if it's one thing. I certainly, well, I, I, I believe in being responsive. That is really probably my version of being accountable. Because in this part of the world, especially in Trinidad and Tobago, <laughs> we have a culture of feeling where you know you don't have to, you don't have to explain yourself to be, you don't have to respond, you don't have to. I don't know. It seems to be really endemic. I didn't see this in Cable or Barbados, for instance. So I believe um, in meeting people one on one. Uh, you know, I, I I like to feel I'm approachable. So which is why I would have things like open hours because as far as I'm concerned, I'm here to serve my staff and my students. So once a week, staff could come in and talk to me, et cetera, et cetera. I've instituted that, which might seem a bit radical, but I did it also as a dean, you know? So um, at first you might get a lot of people, but uh, because of the novelty, but afterwards, you know, people, they don't abuse it or anything. And that was part of the reasons my students knew that um, we cared because you had access if you had a real problem. Yeah, they also might just want to chat. Or <laughs> in my case with the staff, I said, if you have ideas about the campus, I am here to listen. And I think listening is a very important part of my philosophy. I'm quite opinionated, but I also listen. And I am ready to say, hmm, I didn't think of it that way, or maybe I was wrong. I think I grew up in a big family, and you kind of had to be tough and strong to get a word in, because, you know, but I also, while I am tough in that way, and I am not afraid of saying what I want to say, at the same time, I'm used to having a whole lot of voices and different opinions, <laughs> um, you know, and, and I guess that the more, I, the more I live on this earth, I realize your family background really is very important. So having grown up in a very large family, and also quite diverse family, I think it stands me in good stead and I think I understand people fairly well. Um, so I, I believe in listening, I believe in being approachable. I, I am a courageous person. Like I would not back down if I think something is going to be scary or might make me unpopular. It wouldn't, it wouldn't matter, yes, as a uh, probably go and gripe at home, but I will still do it. If I feel it is right, uh, I, I will be clear. And I do believe we lack some of that today. People are very safe with their little code everything stick on their heads and so on. And so we end up doing the same thing over and over and over, although we know it's not working. So I have always considered myself a creative person. Some might say original, what have you, but I, I consider myself creative. So I would think of different ways and different things to do. I wouldn't just do what the other person did. But at the same time, um, I have learned to be a bit more cautious. So uh, you, you see my philosophy coming up. So I don't, I don't think I'm impulsive. I would want to listen to all sides, weigh things, and so on. So I don't know that's a philosophy, but 
I believe that's how I my management style. That is that is how I want to manage. But I I really like people to be open, and uh, I don't. I kind of like being disagreed with, if you know what I mean. I like people to say, let us discuss what it is that we have to discuss, rather than nobody says anything in a meeting and afterwards everybody is disgruntled. I've never <laughs> quite liked that. <laughs> yeah. 20 minutes. So we take a short break and we'll be right back. Okay. And welcome back. We are speaking with Professor Rosemary Bell Antwine and we left off when we were talking about management and her management philosophy. So, you know, we go back to management. And you're a mover and shaker. Right. You're fearless. You said that. You love a challenge. You coming in is going to we there's a there's this again, I don't want to make it sound like it, but there's a great expectations mm -hmm. from probably too many. From not but not 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 without merit, because you're a yeah. lady who's been a trailblazer. Mm -hmm. I mean, by just this alone. It says in your rec in recognition and honor for your work, right? Um, you're a Caribbean woman. Mm. You know, it you you you've experienced the region in academics and academia. How do you think, and how would you get, and how do you intend, or does it matter at all mm. that you get the buy-in of management? Well, I I do believe in persuasion and um, explaining your position. But there are times when you have to take a stand. Yeah? Um, I, I am still very new, so I don't think you come in and you break down. I mean, you, I don't think you, I think you want to, to sort of convince people that let's work together to create change. And sometimes people are not as resistant as you think. It's just that they are accustomed to doing things a particular way. Yes, you might have some really deep issues somewhere, but, um, and of course, I also operate within a wider context, which is a university context. That does, don't forget that. So that, for instance, um, we have a council. I'm sure you know what's happening right now in relation to that. So um, certain decisions on this campus have to be vetted, if you like. Not all, but some important ones have to be vetted by university, sort of. So you, you have to appreciate all of that context. But I, I do believe that um, in terms of management, I believe I can work with my management. I believe that to the extent that where my thinking is different, that it's, it's rational enough to sort of persuade people. Um, and I am hopeful, I'm optimistic. I do get a bit nervous about the, uh, the high expectations. I do realize I came in and a lot of people have said this to me, there's a lot of goodwill and with the goodwill comes the very high. I have to say that I am committed to change, which needs to change, but it is probably in, in not in every case the change will be immediate. Some things have probably already happened, you know, um, so some things have been immediate, but other things, um, take a longer time and also to say to you that democracy is a hell of a thing sometimes you say you want democracy and there are certain processes of put in place which are more democratic and you must sometimes surprise at the results of that democracy let's just put it like that dictatorship is sometimes better huh dictatorship <laughs> is sometimes better <laughs> so sometimes even people say you want change you want change but then when you ask okay let's talk about it, let's vote even on it. Correct. People, you'll be surprised. They stick with what they know. So it is um it's one of those things and but I do believe in 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 discussing, rationalizing, showing people this is a possible way which could be better. What I am clear about is that we cannot continue in the same vein. That much I'm clear about that we have to make some fundamental changes in staff engagement, in student satisfaction, in the way we approach entrepreneurship, in our relationships with the business sector. So far, knock on wood, I think I've, I've made some already some good strides. I, 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 I am quite excited. I'm also very, um, I'm seeing quite a lot of positive signs in relation, even in terms of government, we have to have good relationships. I don't think the campus did enough 
to connect with the major stakeholders. We're kind of stuck in a little cocoon and we're just hoping that, no, you have to work hard at building relationships. Yeah? So, so this is what I am attempting to do. And for me, it's very important, in some ways even more important than, than, than me going out there and getting a, how many millions of dollars. It's more important for my staff to feel engaged, to feel happy, to feel motivated, to feel that they can fulfill their potential because they will do it for me. I don't have to do everything. What I, I want to be more like a facilitator. I want to be a builder to be able to, you know, in, ensure that, that what my staff feels is really important or what their needs to the extent that I can so that we can all work better together as a unit. That is what I would consider to be success. Rather than me having to go out there each time and talk to this one and that one. Because we have some really brilliant people. And not just brilliant, capable people who know how to organize, who are talented. We have all kind of people on this campus, students and staff. And can you imagine if they are working at their optimum and feel motivated, what we can achieve? Great. So that's what I really would like to do. What, in, what caused you, what inspired you, what made you put in the application? Oh God, I think people hit me on the head. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've been, people have been asking me about this for a long time, Dean, I never wanted to be Dean <laughs> for years and years because I'm hey, Dean. And even if it was, and then my life was quite busy, as you mentioned, what my home life was at the time, and I was living in two countries, and I'm still living in two countries. I didn't think I, I used to do a lot of administration on the ground, like on behalf of the dean, you know, doing all the things. And I was just not interested at the time in administration. I wanted to be a professor. I achieved that at a DVH age, and I just continued doing things, and people kept asking me. Fanny, I said, all right, all right, all right. So that was that. And I think it was a similar, to be perfectly honest, this is not something I ever planned. In fact, I, I had planned to leave university because I am a lawyer after all. Mm -hmm. And I have acted as a judge and I've had a lot of invitations there too for the bench. And it's something I am interested in, judiciary. But then somebody said to me, it was really too young for that because, you know, then you're too vocal. You need to do that later on. Because when, <laughs> when you become a judge, you can't speak out. <laughs> So, Unless uh, you're Julian Lucky <laughs> or Frank. <laughs> <laughs> right, yes, those are two. And Julian is the, yeah, somebody I know quite well. About. But no, so um, it really was my peers and even, I probably should this quote, but I mean, not just in this campus, but even at the KFL, a lot of people were saying to me, you should. And I guess I could have been there as well if I had wanted. But And I, I began to think about it and... It seemed somehow inevitable. I don't know why. I, I just, after a while, I kind of said, oh. But it took a long time for me to decide. Because as I said, I felt I'd given university 30-something years, so many years. And I never thought I would stay that long in university. And I thought I should be doing People also wanted me to go back to the international sphere, which is also something. But I kind of had enough of traveling. <laughs> and I wanted to sort of stay in the Caribbean. So I didn't take that too seriously. I think it's peer pressure. <laughs> it's peer pressure. Positive It's peer one pressure. of the times that I've been succumbed, but I mean, haven't done it. So far, I, I, I don't think it was the um, wrong decision. I mean, when you have a, I had a life threatening accident, as you know, mm -hmm. and when these things happen, you do sort of think, maybe you do have a purpose after all, you know, there's something that I left to do. And it seemed, it seemed somehow that there's something that I need to do here. Uh, I don't think I need it. Like, I didn't need it from a CV or anything. But um, I think of it as service, and I think of it as maybe now is the time there are so many things that need to be done that perhaps I can contribute. And so I said, all right. Um, but I, I, it took me a long time to decide, should I do this or should I apply or should I go in the direction of the bench sort of thing? You know, there's CCG, there's this one. The other one, but that's it. But having a having now become professor, having principal, you mean, and and holding professorship, and now having become principal, the only place you could possibly go in, in as you say, judicially, would be to the appeal court in Trinidad and Tobago or, or the CCJ. CCJ. Yeah. It, there's nothing else. 
Yeah. There, there's no other option for well, you. Well, there's the OECS. Yes, yeah. I, I, was a, I acted as OECS. OECS. I acted as yes. a temporary appointment for but, OECS. But I don't like to travel. But even, travel. Even, even, even to sit in the OECS, OECS or in the Eastern Caribbean, you would need to be not a high court judge. You, 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 no, no, no. That way, was, I was at the court of appeals. You're way ahead. Oh, yeah, yeah. You're way ahead, right? And I do even... I, I, so, so it would have to be at that level. Um, but is that something we can look forward to? Well, I, as I said, I, I have a lot of pressure there, too. <laughs> I, I've had a lot of pressure there, too. Um, and I, as, as you probably know from my CV, I, I, I was appointed temporarily. You know, in Court of Appeal, OECS. Um, and I could do a lot more if I had all the time now, but I'm just saying. So it, it is something that's out there. I still something I'm thinking sometime in the future. When I finish this stint, for example, uh, I will look around and say, what next? I'm assuming I would still, if I'm still alive, I would, I'd still want to, um, do, to do work. I don't think I'd be ready because like, I feel younger than I was at 21, except for physically. Yeah, and But that's mentally, I feel, you know, energize and I can I can work at tremendous rates and so on probably better than when I was younger quite frankly um, so I think at 65 which is the age of retirement here I would still be eligible yes for, for some ways which is a good thing so it is something that I would probably think about um, God willing um, that or was it international it's, I don't really plan my life that's another, another yeah, thing I don't really plan things I I find when I plan things so I've always lived, even becoming a lecturer, I didn't plan it. I was invited to lecture. You know, I no intention. I was about to go and work and think, and next thing you know, and then I said, okay, I'm not going to stay for a couple of years and look at me now. So I, I tend not to plan things concisely. I have an, I sort of an idea, yes, this is something I might be interested in doing, but we shall see. Why not add senior counsel? I don't think. I think you have to be practicing. I'm do, not too sure. Do you need to be practicing? Well, I I believe so. Somebody sent me something recently, and I looked at glance at it. I never thought about it really. Um, but no, I never. I I, I I always thought I would practice nonstop when I was a child, and so everybody thought so too. But it didn't turn out that way. So I don't know that people who, unless they go to political office, because that seems to be one way, <laughs> which I, which would not be me. <laughs> Um, but I, I think it says you have to have had a distinguished practice. I think that's how it works. Now, I have done a lot of consultancies. I've done and you're well-researched co- and really, really yes, well Yes, so written. I don't know. I never really thought about it, to be quite honest. It's, I don't really have these ambitions. <laughs> okay. You know. So we talk about professorship. There is the perception among lecturers, senior lecturers, who been encouraged to put their names forward to, for professorship. Um, in some instances, um, some departments are in need of a leader mm-hmm. of that kind, right? But there's the there's always a response that professorship is political. Not at all. Where did you got that from? You tell me. <laughs> Completely wrong. That I'm sure of. That it's not. Not at all. The, the, first of all, it doesn't. It's not even a campus appointment. All the campus does is to do the initial. Um, well, not the campus, the head, the, the faculty does the initial assessment, if you want to put it that way. And, and, and this, it has to, go, once it goes, to, it goes to the university um, appointments committee, not the campus appointments committee, it goes to the university one. Others go to campus, but this one goes to university appointments. And people need to understand that when Professor speaks about university, she talks about the University of the West Indies. Yeah, the all regional, campuses, yes. All There's campuses. a university appointments committee made up of all the campuses also. And then we it, it doesn't even stop there. It then goes out to assessment. But the campus does assist, or the faculty does assist in selecting the assessors, but they have to be vetted. So, for example, you cannot ask, it usually be distinguished people in the field that they would ask to, to assess. So it's external assessors from London or Canada or wherever. These are the ones who assess um, and they have to be at a certain level. You know, you can't just ask anybody, any old buddy. And then they, you have to have at least three. And now we have made it even stricter. We have said you must have three positive 
We normally ask for five assessors, but it's hard to get all five. But it used to be four if you get two positive and one not so. But now that we are insisting that all three must say that you deserve it. And it goes back to university council and everybody agrees. Yeah, so it's not nothing to do with politics whatsoever. That much I'm sure. That is one appointment that we maintain our integrity. Um, the most you can say, if some disciplines or some professors it might be easier than others, but of course we have no control over that. Okay. Yeah, I, I hear you. Like it's whoever the assessor, whatever they say. Some of them are very tough. Some of them are less, you know, seemingly, you know, they do have a disagreements. But as I said, if we don't get three persons saying yes. this person, then we say no. So, you know, successors don't like to talk about their predecessors. And it's a good practice. And so there's, you, put, <laughs> you know, I'll put you in that, I'll put you on the spot there. Um, you are changing things. You are shaking but things. But not up. yet. But, uh, but you can see it, right? Yeah. You've, I mean, you said you just entered, you just come in. But in so far in our discussion, um, you've made strides. And well, you, I don't know yet. I have, don't know what people perceive as strides, but I'm certainly trying. Yeah. Well, you know everybody refers to you as RBA, right? RBA? No, I didn't know. You didn't? I'm already RMBA, but that's okay. <laughs> so, RBA, so, I didn't know. So that. they say. Ah, ah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm scared. I'm laugh at the camera. But no, we, we, that's also, you know, so everybody, there's a lot of people who says RBA. Okay. Right? They say, who talked to RBA? Okay. You know, RB is making strides. I never knew that. You know, RB is bringing a different, um, a different perspective. Um, I'm sure people who listen to the show, they wouldn't. Some of them wouldn't realize that you do have an open day on a Wednesday <laughs> for people to come speak with you. Yes. Right. Yes, yes. And that's a form of motivation from a management level that speaks volumes. Right. It's also going to improve um, performance. Mm -hmm. Right. But they, there was the, there's not only the perception, there's the belief that your predecessor polarized the university campus and polarized it in a manner that turned it into a principal's club. And what you are bringing to the table is access to the head of the university, mm -hmm. access to anybody who wants to see you, access where people can feel that they have a, if, if all else fails, they can still come to you. Mm -hmm. many, many people may say that because she is female, mm -hmm. she has that level of understanding and compassion and care mm -hmm. as compared to a male counterpart. You want to comment on that polarization? Well, I, I, I don't forget I was new to the campus. I, only came, I was on cable for all those years, so... I don't know if it was better or worse. I mean, I came at the end of Principal Sankat's um, tenure. So it's difficult for me to have a long view. But the one in your But I, oh, and I, again, I, I, I wouldn't wish to comment per se on my predecessor, but I do uh, think perhaps this campus is simply reflective of the society and the way they handle management. I don't know that it's, um, one person or two persons, you know, so um, maybe there isn't that culture. The culture more is if you're a manager, you're there, and if the rest, I mean, I think that's probably part of the culture. For a lot of people, that's how they perceive management or leadership. You know, like some people have a little trick, for instance, like, you know, somebody's coming to see you, make them wait 15 minutes. I mean, like, I hate that. <laughs> Either as I was on time, because... I don't want people to wait on me. I find it disrespectful, to, unless not, there's a genuine reason. You know, there are all these little sort of things such as when I'm in charge, and you see it a lot. So I, 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 I don't know if that is to do with the with, with how people perceive leadership should be. It shouldn't be too accessible. You know, you're not. What is it? You should um, make it familiarize yourself. People have these ideas that there's a. I just don't believe in that. I mean, I'm not. A person put it to the point where you feel you could call me up on a Sunday morning and talk straight <laughs> to me about your boyfriend and your girlfriend or something, right? 
even as a, as a lecturer, I was the same. I was someone used to come to me for all kinds of issues, even before I was dean or, or deputy and so on. But it would never, I never had a problem of students disrespecting me or being familiar or not knowing boundaries. Because I was saying, no, no, when I'm home, you know, you, you know, they were very respectful. So it's just my way. Um, I feel that the leaders should should be accessible and they should be approachable and they should understand their context. And I think that's how else do you know what's happening and what what are the issues if you don't speak to people? That, right. That's all I see it as. I don't think there's any big thing about polarizing. I also think that you have to be sensitive um, to understand that sometimes you may not intend something. You talk about polarization. You may not intend it, but if you're not aware of the social context, you could find yourself making decisions that give that impression. So I cannot tell you whether it is people doing A or B, C, or it's just people not thinking about it, and that is the impact. I don't know. Um, but I am a, hopefully a little more sensitive to those issues. But again, I, I really can't comment. I really don't know how long the campus that perception was, if it indeed is that. I don't know. I'm still a bit of a newbie. You know, you, you before we take the break, you did say sensitive and sensitivity, and that's very important. Yeah. And, I mean, from my own experience, here, these hollowed, these hollowed holes mm -hmm. were unapproachable, untouchable. Yeah. You couldn't get an audience. Yeah, yeah, but you brought this level of newness. And, you know, it, it, it's going to be reflected in, in, in so many ways as we discussed, you know, um, which is in itself an achievement. The very fact that we can sit and have this yeah. very casual conversation, but very critical conversation, um, says a lot about the individual that I'm speaking to. And this is not me brown nosing, it's just that this is a big deal, right? It is a big deal. So when we come back, we want to talk about principal's vision, which she's already started to, uh, you know, implement and discuss about where she t intends to take the University of the West Indies with it after. We come back. Welcome back to, you know, one of the best conversations I've had in throughout the real politic. Uh, we're talking to our principal at UNIB, St. Augustine, Professor Rosemary Balanchine. Prof, we just saw you, um, Lady Breck. Oh. Lady Breck to a chocolate factory. Tell me about that laying of Oh, that was one of the most pleasant tasks I've had. But, you know, that Cocoa Research Center and its director, Prof. Pat Marin, they are so Passionate. inspirational, yeah. is the word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We call him Prof. Pat. Yeah, <laughs> it's a long yeah. name. Yeah. From Maharan. You know, he has done so much for this country and this region in terms of agriculture and science and innovations. You know, I want to people know that he's the one with the hot pepper, the scorpion who sort of identified this scorpion that we all talk about. You know, he's done other work with cut flowers and um, with pigeon peas, you know, all various strains and so, but of course we know him more now with the cocoa. I keep saying he revolutionized, and his team revolutionized the cocoa industry, and it's not an understatement. No, it's not. So we have the Cocoa Research Center, probably number one in the world in terms of cocoa research centers. Then we have the Seed Bank, undoubtedly number one largest seed bank in the world and we have trained UWE, we meaning UWE and his team. We have been the one in terms of the chocolate tears that you see developing. We train them, we nurture them and so on and now is the time for us now to get into that part of it. We've done the scientific innovations in agriculture and the cocoa We've done the training, we will continue to do that as well. But now the university wants to be more entrepreneurial and certainly this is not my um, trust alone. I've inherited that desire and it started way back when, even Motawari, Sankar, everybody 
we've been wanting to be more entrepreneurial. Now it's part of our official doctrine, strategic goal, revenue revolution. So I was happy to adopt that as part of my own goal. And so that cocoa factory, I think is, as I said, is the epitome of when you have um, intellectual capability and innovation and meeting community needs and revenue generation, all of these coming together in one happy project. And for many, many years, he was trying to get it off the ground. So I was very pleased to be able to come in and do my little thing to get it started. And we've started, and there's tremendous interest. You would have heard the minister, they're also very keen to get the cocoa um, industry um, going, moving ahead. We used to be big, yeah, big king. Um, and it's such an inspiration, as I said. It's one of our three uh, big entrepreneurial projects. The other one is the Global uh, Medical School, and then we have the alumni one. But what it does also, I, I think it also galvanizes uh, the rest of the campus and to the possibilities. Because now I'm asking each of my faculties and each department to be more entrepreneurial. I don't want us to lose sight of our academic focus and learning for learning's sake, that's not what I'm saying, but to try to think more creatively as to how we can be. So for example, the Faculty of Humanities, we have a wonderful new dean, Prof. Um, Hack Walker Hackshaw. Yes. So now she's near thinking, what can we do in film? Because we have a film, they have a film department. Yeah. In order to make some money as well as develop the film industry in Trinidad and Tobago, things like that. You know, we have, well, science of course is already, the Faculty of Science is already doing a lot. We have some wonderful um, inventors, all of these sealers. I have to say this has been very exciting for me because it's sort of a new thing to work with these scientists. And so they're plastic sealers. We have the business interested. Ansel has said that they're interested and we're really, really excited about that. To, to not just make a little to buy for better money, you know, we want to make big bucks. And there are millions of dollars in cocoa, as the minister said, as well as in these things that we've invented, mm -hmm. the plastic sealants, the roofing compounds, the marine sealants, these are tremendous inventions. If we were university abroad, we would already attracted millions of dollars from private sector to develop and to commercialize. And I went to a lecture, one of our new professors recently too, and, and he was making the same point about some of the, 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 the scientific experiments and innovation they've done like in all water and, finding resistant um, organisms to, to, you know, this thing about the, we are now not being able to assimilate antibiotics. It's now, so they're inventing things that can help us. But if there was somewhere else, cause he said he has a, a student who went off to Harvard and is doing the research, they probably will get the credit, but it's our research at UE. But we don't have the capital to put the millions initially to then make even more millions. And that's something that frustrates me a bit because we have a relatively small business sector and they tend not to be, they tend to be retail more than like say cocoa. manufacture and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But so, so the cocoa factory and the sealants and so that we've invented in our labs um, and more things are coming up. Faculty of Agriculture has, has invented a pesticide, organic Wonderful. pesticide. I mean, it's just so inspiring what people at UE St. Augustine are doing, and the, the public needs to know these things. Yes, they do. And we need to work with the private sector and government to commercialize them, to develop them. We've done the legwork and to get them to market. And once we can get them to market, and we're confident that they are viable, they are excellent products, then we can also become more self-sustainable, self-sufficient. We can be sustainable, and we have the overlay of being green, because that's another thing I've said, I want to green the campus. Um, and we've started looking at that as well. You know, the, the things that we do should also be, for me, two things have to happen. One, they have to be environmentally sound. And the second is that they must meet real community needs. So the things that we do should really um, address the needs of, you know, what does Trinidad and Tobago want as a nation? What are some of the things they need? In other words, what are some of the problems we have? Let's design and invent things to solve some of those problems. That's where I would like to see the university going. And we have the capacity. 
we have the capacity. So I think I, I see a very rosy future. <laughs> Forget the pun, I didn't mean it. <laughs> as soon as I realized it came out at me. You know, I see, but again, I am not a scientist. I can't invent anything. I mean, I would like to invent some things since my accident. I'm thinking of things, you know, in terms of AIDS to help people and stuff. <laughs> but I don't know if I'll ever get there. But what I see my role is as being able to support my colleagues, you know, encourage them, go out there, try to get the, the, the funding and so on, the seed money, these sorts of things to get this going. And I think I'm getting that enthusiasm. I'm very pleased with my deans, for instance. And, and those are the leading departments because we've been having retreats and so, and people are coming up with some excellent ideas. So I think it's a great time to, to move forward and hopefully we can, we can do so. But Chocolate Factory to me mm -hmm. is, 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 is just a way of, of showing us how we can do this and giving us the hope that we can really do it. When does it, in, when do you tend to make it operational? Because I know we know Well, he said by the end of the year, but he's a fella, he doesn't make any jokes, eh? so he said by the end of the year, the fact should be. So um, I think by next year, we should begin to see um, some real gains and so on. And there are investors interested because one of the things that we have to do that I've said we should do, which is why I, I have grouped the Faculty of Agriculture in the discussion, we shouldn't just do a chocolate factory. We are also interested in the cocoa industry itself because yeah. we have to produce more cocoa. Yes. People have gone out of cocoa. And we don't just go out there and produce cocoa and tell people grow cocoa. No. Mm -hmm. The university, we are already doing it on a small scale, but we have to um, put our scientific efforts into improving things like cocoa yield. He's already doing some of that, and our culture is doing resistance of pests. Uh, all those fancy ways, I'm a gardener, so the aquaponics and all those sort of things. We have to find ways to make the farming of the cocoa more attractive, more lucrative. And we're already doing it. We have to get lands back into cocoa. There's a lot of work to be done. We're not going to do all ourselves, but I think that we can be the leaders, the catalysts, you know, get the thing. And, you know, he works, the CRC works already with farmers, so does the faculty of agriculture. So, the fact that we have, and I say this all the time, the only faculty of agriculture in the whole University of West Indies, I think we really need to underscore that. Correct. There's no other, and mm -hmm. we need to capitalize on it, and we are doing it. So there are some exciting things ahead, I believe. Do you think there's a, a way in which we could also train farmers? Well, we are training farmers, but we have to train more farmers. But it's not just training farmers. Again, you go back to context, sociology, culture, all those things. We all know what has happened with farming. So it's not just university alone. Create, like, um, I understand that we once created something that I think a body resistant, something or other, body resistant. And if farmers didn't want it, they prefer to use the chemicals, it was easier. So you know, you have to break the culture. Un right. You have to, and it's, it's a holistic, I kind of don't like that word, but I can't think of another word where it's, private public sector partnership with us mm -hmm. to really show people out there that this is not just to make to squeak eke out a living and bare bones but a viable industry once more because people don't really understand it or believe it and things have to be in place for it so they have a few people who will go out there and doing it stuff like that but to get it in a broad in a broad way where many people can be once more either that or maybe you, if, if you can't do that, at least get somebody one said we have Venezuelan migrants over to the agriculture. You have to do something to get people to show them the way because people need to be shown the way. Agreed. Yeah. Um, you talk about global health. Mm -hmm. um, there's been a conversation, there's been comments that more needs to be done from the Faculty of Medical Sciences as it pertains to research. Hmm. I think what happens with, with UV, it always has been the case. We do a lot of stuff, we put it in a nice journal, and, and we forget it about it. And many years ago, I did a speech on that, and I remember it was quoted a lot, of one, but we forgot it again. I remember when, when I had got the first VC award um, research, I, I did the address. And one of the things I said was that when we go to the supermarket, I always remember saying that people, and we see a tomato or a yam, we have to know that this is a, was invented in a UV lab. 
because we don't realize that you know they create all these hybrid tomatoes and yams and all these sort of things and we eat it it's not packaged so there's we're not visible in the public's eye right. the research that we're doing because we have done tremendous research in all kinds of things and people just not aware including in medicine i mean prof simango the current dean is was cited as one of the top researchers in the world in his field and that doesn't come lightly and then there are things in diabetes happening all kinds of things happening but yes i'm not going to say that there isn't room for improvement more obviously. specifically towards cancer research cancer you know I, I don't know i mean i don't know what we're doing right now in cancer but in terms of the university wide because i was pvc of research before i am aware of tremendous research that is happening in all kinds of areas in medicine in fact medicine is one of the areas where i think we are quite cutting edge um, we are now about to convert the fertility center in unit into a center wow because of the tremendous research you're doing that so the, the point i'm making is i can't give you a list of all the things to do but but the perception that we're not doing anything is not correct that's and much, that is that's much we, i would say and i think that you made a good point that we need to brand it there needs to be greater branding that, yeah visibility yeah and, that, and I, visibility for the universe as a whole which is why i started that column on climate change and so that I had news people ask my scientists to write and you have to bring it to the people because they just don't know what's going to go on may not quite know they might know for certain things but a lot is happening but the, the university needs to be much more entrenched in the community people need to know what's happening they need to be part of it they need to be meeting with the community all of these things we need to do a lot more but I cannot say that we are not doing cutting edge of good research and of course also research needs funding as well just remember that too. of course and do you think that more can be done but you did mention it but should we be less dependent on government and more dependent on private sector and yes the answer must certainly be yes but what the but is this as i just said unfortunately we don't have a private sector that is in itself entrepreneurial to a large extent and Correct. it's not a criticism it is simply that a lot of our private sector is a retail sector. Mm -hmm. And we don't have that tradition. Like in the States, they will give how many millions a university, like Pfizer will give how many millions to universities to create a vaccine. Or, to, or, or what's that big one? Astra. Pharmaceutical people. They will give this university X millions. And, and I, I remember I went to a cannabis factory um, in Canada. Yeah, I was a can I'm the marijuana lady, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I went and I saw a minister of Jamaica. So I, I want you know what fascinated me most. I mean, this is really the region. There was a whole room in this huge factory plant, whatever they call it, and in there, that room they had. X amount, probably 20 or so postdocs, people who just finished their PhD. They were hired simply to sit down all day, I'm not exaggerating, drink coffee, eat chips, and brainstorm. That's all they were paid, plenty of money to sit, to sit there and think about things to do with cannabis, you know, the products or whatever ways. And these people felt it's worth their time and money to do this, and they will get the results. Now, how are you competed with that? Do you think we can do it here? <laughs> okay, as I said, this requires money and we have to have that thinking that you, you can't just do the basics. You have to believe in the creative process. So you have these young people, literally, I sat and chat chatted with them. I was so blown out. That's what I had to do. They, they are chatting and then they will come up, oh, you know, why don't we do this? And they will they have people to help them. They test it and they have a new product, make how many millions and that's it. If 19 of them never come up with anything no problem but if one comes up with one it's worth the time and effort so unless we start thinking about things in that way you know how are we gonna we can do it yes but we have to and that's another motto i had for this year's budget invest now and save later gain later reap later but you have to do the investment and this is chocolate factory is part of an investment as we are making this as we're going to invest in the products that our scientists have created but you can't just create it and then 
to lay thumbs and hope somebody no you have to believe in what you're doing and that is what some of these other countries and universities do i mean i saw the statistics for not just the the, the usas and so on but like the singapore's and so on in fact singapore and and um a couple of those pacific countries are actually spending more now on the us than the us in terms of their supporting their research. entrepreneurial research and all of that that they know why they're doing it so, so that's something that's a that's a pitch mm -hmm. for for our and that's why we still need to rely on government, unfortunately, yeah. to a large extent. But I do hope that that in the present dispensation of this university, that the government understands that it is a way for us to to, to pave the foundation to be more self sufficient. Because it's I'm clear in my mind that we have to be more self sufficient. But right now, we do need support tangible support, whether it comes from private sector, public sector, in terms of the investment. Thank you. So, Principal, we've had a fantastic, well, all-around, so. <laughs> wonderful, very straightforward conversation, no fluff. You've been a fantastic host to us as well. I must say thank you very much for taking, um, acceding to my request and, you know, it you blew my mind with regard to not just the principal, but the individual. It cemented my thoughts on the individual. And I, I am excited by the fact that we have someone like you sitting in the chair and in the office, and it gives us a lot of hope. So I do want to wish you all the very best in your tenure and all of the successes that you um, achieve I think the University of the West Indies St. Augustine has been gifted um, with someone who has, and I know you don't like the word, but has vision <laughs> and who is a transformational leader and your record speaks for itself. So thank you very much, Principal. Well, thank you for those kind words and I'll certainly try my best not to disappoint. I don't think you would. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> This has been the first episode of season three of Real Politik. This is Dr. Shane Mohammed signing off on what has been a wonderful interview. I do look forward to seeing you next week. Take care.